um, is loading up now, right? Um, I have the unenviable task of following up in the final slot of the day, um, a slew of fantastic presentations from various different people who have shown the, the level of detail with which they have dissected the various data sets we have from the North Sea landscape. Um, but, you know, I like a challenge, so I'll give it a go. Um, uh, there won't be anything quite so technical from me, but I guess I'm going to try and sum up some of the uh, key points and extrapolate some further implications from some of what we've heard of today <clears throat> uh, with regards to the archaeology, that is. Um, and I guess I would start by going back to thinking about Doggerland within a broader global context and the sort of recent history of submerged paleolandscape archaeology. Um, I think at least within the discipline, we've moved away from those somewhat tired old notions that there's nothing there, that people didn't live there, that even if they did live there, it's all being destroyed now, or we have enough stuff on land that we don't need to look at what's under the water anyway. Um, so I think we, we've kind of moved past that, at least within the discipline. And we've also begun to recognize that um, some of these submerged paleo landscapes at different times in the past might have actually been quite attractive places to live and that they also might have been staging grounds for some really exciting and important events and processes in human history. Uh, the peopling of the Americas along the submerged Pacific coastline, um, diaspora throughout island Southeast Asia and Australasia. We're going to be hearing a bit more about this stuff tomorrow, I think, so there's not much more to be said except for um, Doggerland, obviously, which was mentioned at the very beginning of the conference today, is the certainly among the, if not the best studied submerged paleo landscape that we have in the world at the moment. Um, so, uh, a big part of this presentation is going to be um, based around the work of the, the various colleagues I have on the ELF team and, and a lot of what's been talked about today. I will also be drawing upon researchers from other fields, collaborators and colleagues from different projects, uh, archaeologists and non-archaeologists, um, to talk a little bit about how this landscape changed and, and what this means for our understanding of it during the early Holocene and also more broadly the North Sea Basin and Northwest Europe during this time. Um, so the map you can see in the, the smaller map there in the top left uh, is a map published in 2018 by the Brit Ice team. Um, and we picked up on this, we thought it was quite important. It, it shows that the northernmost extent of the Doggerland landscape was not as far north um, as has traditionally been thought of, even going quite far back. So that's uh, 21,000 years ago. Um, and the larger map shows the coastline for the north at 10 and a half thousand years ago. We see that not much has really changed here. Um, you can also see in the south, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but if you can, you can see in the south, we have this deeply incised uh, marine inlet here that um, Simon was talking a bit about earlier in his presentation. This is where we think the coastline was roughly at 10,500 years ago. Now, I know that coastlines are difficult things to reconstruct, that sea level index points uh, can vary quite a lot locally, and we have to factor in glacio isostatic adjustment models too. But these are uh, uh, modeled coastlines that we are getting better at being able to refine as time goes on. Um, and these have some broader implications. So we can now support uh, the argument from, from some in Scandinavia that Doggerland was probably not uh, a staging point for the colonization of Scandinavia at the end of the Paleolithic. We can also say that the lack of Doggerland north of the Dogger Bank makes it hard to imagine that any Arensbergian folk might have been coming to Scotland via this route. They may have been coming through the mainland UK or up a submerged coastline, but the lack of an actual Doggerland landmass north of this point uh, makes it difficult to see how it could have figured in these models, which it sometimes has done. Um, it also means that the Viking Bergenflint, which uh, is found far north of the Dogger Bank, um, is either much older than the LGM or alternatively has been reworked and moved there post depositionally. And this map kind of really brings these points home, I think. 
Um, you can see that there's a relatively stable coastline to the north between 16,000 and 11,000. And after 11,000 is when um, the landscape begins to change quite rapidly. Um, I, I, would, I would emphasize that the point of this is that there is a landscape there. I'm not trying to imply that it is um, static throughout this time and unchanging, just that the coastline does not move inland that much, or at least that's what it looks like. Um, and you can see in the south in that little white box, the, the cluster of fine spots and that we have around that southern marine inlet and around the brown bank that Ruth was just talking about there. So we've established that Doggerland was there throughout the, the late glacial and post-glacial. Um, we know that southern Doggerland was never glaciated, even during the worst excesses of MIS-2. And if we look at the Southern River Valley cores that various people have been talking about earlier on, um, the Southern River Valley would have been not too far south of the, uh, the most southerly glacial extent during um, the LGM. And one core in particular, L34, has some particularly interesting bits and pieces going on in it. Um, we see what we typically think of as early Mesolithic arboreal taxa appearing early on, um, birch, pine and hazel, because it wouldn't be a talk about Mesolithic archaeology if we didn't talk about hazel. Um, and there are also other lines of evidence that suggest there might have been uh, some strange things going on here, uh, perhaps warm loving fish and, and other types of data. I mean, I guess the point of this is that as you've seen throughout today, this project entails a large number of different specialists working on a wide variety of different data types and trying to integrate those different data, having a multi-proxy approach is really the strength of this project. This is one core. Um, I will not try an over egg pudding here. It is just one core, um, but we are pulling together different lines of evidence and it does seem like these tags are appearing relatively early on during the Younger Dries. Um, perhaps this is part of a mini refugia of some sort. Perhaps this is just one small isolated area within a much broader landscape where things never got quite that bad that, that, that um, trees died off in the way we thought they might. Um, there are various issues with this. Like I say, it is just one core, but we're already starting to see a few unusual patterns that we're hopeful we can continue investigating in the future as the project continues. And um, I guess if the point about Doggerland being there in the Paleolithic is interesting, um, that it was there and relatively stable in terms of that northern coastline, what happens in the Holocene is a very different story. And we're faced with a very dynamic landscape then with the, with the coastline changing relatively rapidly. Um, here we can see how uh, the Dogger Bank landmass goes from being an upland area to an island to a relatively diminished island by around 8,000 BP. Um, and we can also see uh, the evolution of that marine inlet to the south that Simon, Phil, and colleagues in Belgium, Michael de Klerk, and, and people have been working on. And um, I guess what you can really see here is that Britain actually separates from mainland Europe a little bit earlier than has, has traditionally been thought in a lot of circles quite recently. Um, we reckon around nine and a half thousand years ago, which is quite closely aligned with what Graham Clark predicted back in the 1930s, funnily enough. Um, and a lot of the emphasis on Doggerland since the work of Brian e. Coles has been seeing this as a landscape that was habitable. And I think, you know, we still need to emphasize that point. But we also begin to see with the narrowing of the strip that connected Britain to the rest of the mainland, that the land bridge element may also have been important for fauna and flora that were native to Britain prior to the separation and indeed for, for people and, and different animals and plants moving inwards. These are all things that we might try and look at in the future as well through distribution analyses. Um, I think that we have sites like Star Car and Boulder Cliff now with evidence of waterfaring technology. So we know that the British Mesolithic people were just as capable of this kind of stuff as their European counterparts were. So uh, the opening up of this inlet and the various other waterways that were changing within Doggerland may not have been unnavigable to people, but, but the narrowing of this connection is nevertheless uh, an important revelation, I think, particularly at how early on it's happening. 
And thanks to the various work that people have been doing, we've been able to zone in at a resolution that's previously not been possible. Now, some of the maps we're making are still, you know, it's important to mention that they are still relatively crude and generalized. Um, but it nevertheless allows us to begin to think of some aspects of the submerged landscape in a way that we've previously not been able to in terms of where lithic outcrop locations might have been in terms of different ecosystems um, where people might have had to go for freshwater fish as opposed to marine resources that kind of stuff um, although it is very coarse and, and simplified we're beginning to actually think about parts of the southern uh, north sea landscape like this now um, and uh, this slide shows i've stolen this shamelessly from simon in his presentation earlier shows uh, one such sort of schema for, for what the East Anglian romp, as we're calling it, might have looked like a part of Doggerland that survived a bit longer than some other places. Towards the end of the Mesolithic, um, we have two events that we struggle to grapple with. One is the Storega tsunami, um, and the other is the 8.2 event. Now, the Storega tsunami, uh, by all accounts, does appear to have been a terrifyingly huge wave um, but because of the isostatic adjustment we haven't found much evidence of it from the southern north sea basin and the traditional narrative surrounding the strega tsunami is that that was uh, the end of doggerland um, however we we know that tsunamis typically don't result in permanent inundation and when we found evidence of strega in one of our cores elf the aptly named elf 1a um, we found a return through the various proxy data we had a return to a terrestrial signature after the tsunami deposit, indicating this return, perhaps not to normality, but a return nevertheless. Um, we also know that tsunamis have a highly regionally variable effect, so they might hit some places much worse than others. Um, and with the new modeling we have about how the coastline is changing and, and the rates of inundation, we think that the dogger island as it would have then been may well have been inundated when the strega tsunami happened um, if it was inundated or even if it was still there it may have also had an impact on the damage that the wave caused to areas to the south it may have exacerbated it in some areas and it may have mitigated the impact in others um, so we're at least beginning to move towards a more nuanced understanding of events such as the, the strega tsunami and with regards to the 8.2 event, well, this is perhaps why um, much of the Dogger Island um, had become inundated by this time. You can see that there was a relatively rapid rise in sea level um, just prior to the Strega tsunami happening. And for archaeologists, uh, we often talk about the 8.2 event in terms of a temperature drop. Um, but actually, perhaps the bigger issue, certainly for people living in Doggerland and in and around the North Sea Basin would have been the rise in sea level and the changes that that had on the landscape. Because neither the Strega tsunami nor the 8.2 event actually spelt the real end of Doggerland, uh, we might want to think a bit more carefully about the existence of submerged coastal fringes into the late Mesolithic and beyond. Um, previous attempts uh, have have been made at uh, reconciling the fragmentation of Doggerland with changes apparent in the uh, Mesolithic archaeology. Um, some of the, the work on the, the house at Howick has been linked to this in the past. I mean, it, it now seems from what we were talking about earlier that Britain may have separated much earlier than these models suggest. It doesn't mean that they're not related somehow, but it's less, um, it's less well aligned than, than the previous models had us thinking. Um, but it's nevertheless important to think about the impact that the fragmentation and, and uh, diminishment of this landscape might have had, um, how uh, social networks may have fragmented too. We know, for example, from the work of people like Peter Gendel in the 1980s about how waterways may have acted as uh, territorial barriers, but equally from, from other researchers such as Chris Tell and Smith, that they may have been important routeways and highways that connected territories and groups with one another and trying to think about these in a dynamic way um, i mean it, it's difficult enough within the framework of terrestrial archaeology but we have to bear these 
ideas in mind as we see, um, broadly speaking, a, a roughly, a relatively homogenous uh, final Paleolithic across this area um, become a bit more fragmented. And, and we also have to contend with the idea that this landscape may have survived into the Neolithic um, to some extent. Um, we have the Ertebola and Swifterband, for example, kind of similar in some respects here. Um, the linear band keramic coming up behind them, maybe they're facing increased pressure between the coast and the incoming farmers. This is all a bit speculative, but there are ideas that we need to reconsider. Um, yes, the habitable landscape has diminished significantly, but the relative available coastline is increasing, uh, and that's something that doesn't often get talked about. The stuff I've talked about so far all kind of relates to how the various research done under the ELF project and other colleagues and collaborators has transformed in the last few decades and, and even recent years our understanding of the Doggerland landscape and, and what this might mean for archaeology of it. Um, when it actually comes to archaeology, uh, we have a bit of a different story on our hands. With regards to Britain, most famous submerged Mesolithic sites, uh, Gold Cliff in the Severn Estuary and Tidal Site, uh, and Boulder Cliff, which I think we'll be hearing about again tomorrow uh, in the Solent. We have a few sites in the north of northeast of England um, and some more around the Thames Estuary, including stratified sites. But, but these are actually some of them quite far inland, up, up uh, river valleys and, and so on. Um, again, if we look at the Danish stuff, there's, there's huge amounts of submerged Mesolithic archaeology in Denmark. Fantastic work is being done there still. Uh, Anders Fischer and colleagues and Peter Maestrup and some others. But most of this stuff is focused around the Store Belt, which I'm sure I've just pronounced incorrectly, but never mind. Uh, and the Limfjord region. We have relatively few examples, as hopefully you can see here on the Atlantic facing coast of Denmark. Um, likewise, in the Netherlands, we have the Yangtze Harbour site, which is a truly unique site at the moment. Um, excavated at a depth of 20 to 25 meters plus, I think. Um, but most of the evidence, again, we have comes from the infrastructure development at the Europort zone or from beach replenishment um, exercises. Uh, we have relatively little stuff coming from the offshore zone beyond the 12 nautical mile limit. And the 12 nautical mile limit is the area for which all these countries, barring Belgium, because they signed up to the UNESCO treaty, um, are legally required to protect and investigate. Um, so we see we have relatively few sites from this offshore zone beyond 12 nautical miles. Most of the sites we have are find spots. Most of them are clustered so far around that uh, southern marine inlet and the Brown Bank area. Uh, relatively few on the Dogger Bank. We lack stratified sites. Um, there's only two from the North Sea. There's Seat and Crew, which hasn't been in, in the northeast of England, which hasn't been investigated properly since the 1930s, I don't think. And we have the, the Yangtze Harbour site, which I just mentioned. So, and I think the difficulties of looking for this stuff are reasonably well known. Um, it gets worse the further out at shore you go, and the deeper you want to go, there's problems with visibility, there's problems with sediment and water overburden. Uh, it becomes expensive to get the right equipment, which gets a, a coarse resolution of excavation. Um, it becomes quite dangerous, I think, to go diving beyond depths of about 24, 25 metres or so. That There are various issues we have to contend with from a logistical perspective. And then, of course, there's actually finding the stuff. And, and um, a lot of people have talked about Pete today, and Ruth was just talking about it too. And I mean, Heat and the Morlog deposits that we've, we've been talking about as well are at the heart of Mesolithic archaeology in the North Sea. Uh, this is a map from 1909 showing that Morlog deposits as were then known from this area. Um, and really the history of Mesolithic archaeology is inextricably entwined with uh, peat studies. The Kalinda harpoon um, found not far away from the refugia core, which I'm dangerously terming it from earlier, um, around a similar date, uh, the late Younger Dryas. That was found in a, in a lump of moor log. Star Carr famously found in a peat bog by Graham Clark, um, who was part of the Fenland Research Committee with people like Harry and Margaret Godwin, 
people inspired by the Coinda Harpoon and the work of people like Clement Reed. Um, even the even the the, the Maglamosian culture, the name comes from the Maglamos peat bog. Um, so it's difficult to get away from uh, the importance of peat here. Peat may not have been an attractive place for people to live, which might be a bit of a problem for us, but it does preserve or, or can preserve organic materials that we sometimes lack from terrestrial Mesolithic sites. And um, whereas, as Vince was saying at the very beginning of today, early research in this project was aimed at river channels because they were things that we could look for and we could build up from there. We're now reaching a point on this slide is shamelessly stolen from Andy Fraser. Um, we're now looking at a point where we can start to reconstruct peat in other parts of the landscape and think about where else we might want to look at at least peat, if not for areas of potential human occupation and the various preservation qualities they might hold. And then really on a sort of more abstract theoretical level, we need to be able to know where people were, we need to be able to know where archaeology might survive, and we need these two things to co-align. So that's what we're looking for. Um, the phrase a needle in a haystack has been used several times. I think Ruth just used it in her talk. Um, and um, I think I also like the idea of the Swiss cheese model, which is something that's used in, uh, in risk aversion modeling. Um, so I, I think Penny Spikens and Morton Engen likened this to uh, looking for archaeology in submerged conditions as like field walking in dense thick fog. So imagine someone's dropped a slice of cheese over the North Sea and we have to choose where we want the holes. And we want the holes to overlie with that overlap in that Venn diagram between where people were and where things might survive. And of course, we're using predominantly terrestrial data sets, ethnographic data sets that might be highly generalized, or derived from relatively recent history, um, and otherwise non-analogous. And um, I mean, the good thing at least is that we are able to take some of the uh, more developed paleogeographic data sets we have and, and develop models of threat and uncertainty and preservation potential for future perception. Ben switched on. I'm getting there, Ben. Don't worry. Um, so this isn't all doom and gloom, though. In 2019, um, a expedition between uh, British and Belgian colleagues went out. Uh, I think they did a lot of surveying work over the Brown Bank area, some of the stuff that Ruth was talking about. Um, they also went out to the Southern River Valley, and we uh, came back with the Southern River Valley Flint. Now, the lithics study of this suggests that this is a um, debitage fragment from a hammerstone. And really the significance of this is that we know there is a early Holocene, potentially land surface in this area. Uh, yes, this is a single find. Yes, it comes from the surface and not from a stratified context, but this is the first time, and I think this is a global first, might be wrong, but I think it's a global first, that people have gone out into the offshore zone with the objective of looking for archaeology and come back having found it. Um, so it's, it's a silver lining of what might yet be to come. And, and that's really thanks to the resolution that people have been able to provide. I think Ruth summed it up really well when she was talking about the various British cities you were moving between in that survey area. Um, we're covering a huge huge area and we're beginning as, as we saw in Martin's presentation not without caveats and problems and issues but we're beginning to reach a point where we might actually be able to provide a localized resolution of data. With regards to the future I'm sure many of you certainly in Britain will be aware of the plans for new green energy sources um, and I think most of us can probably agree that this is a good thing that we need to be looking for more carbon neutral ways of powering country. Um, and this is something that's not just happening in Britain, it, it's going to be happening in various countries around the world and in and around the North Space. And you can see this map here that Rachel kind of made, um, just how much of the North Sea is going to be taken up by offshore wind farms in the future. Um, you can also see just how much of the Doggerland area we have that will be covered up by this. Um, this could be a problem 
but thanks to the cooperation and collaboration of people at Royal Haskening who have really given a significant chunk of data over to us, we're hoping that we can actually work with these companies to take us to the next step, which will hopefully be kind of like Ruth was hinting at, at the end of her project, getting down to questions at a real archaeological level. So um, I'm really standing on the shoulders of giants here today. I'm talking generally about stuff that other people have talked about in much greater detail. Um, it's a point worth emphasizing that there are so many different specialists involved in this and it's needed to make this work. The work is ongoing. I'm only really able to talk about preliminary findings at the moment. Um, but already our understanding of the Dogoland landscape throughout the early Holocene and terminal Pleistocene has changed massively compared to how it stood, say, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and we had a bit of a discussion at lunchtime uh, amongst the panelists about how to explain this. Um, to, just to hit the point home, we, we thought maybe we could appease European colleagues and use Belgium as a reference. Uh, the Yorkshire contingent obviously wanted us to use Yorkshire, but we went with the time honored tradition in Britain of comparing things to an area the size of Wales. Now, Doggerland is not just an area the size of Wales, it's an area the size of Wales eight times over. Um, just to give you an idea of just how huge an area of land we're, we're talking about, its maximal extent. Um, of course, the actual human geography of this landscape is lagging behind the physical geography somewhat, but we know that let's have all these tantalizing hints that it's there. There's a paper just this year, a really exciting paper talking about how um some of the bone points may actually be made of human bone there's all this kind of stuff okay we don't have stratified sites yet but people are doing fantastic work with what we do have we're just hoping that we can maybe soon be able to take it to the next level um, and the future well it's really going to rest on what we can do in collaboration with the various stakeholder industries none of what has been done so far in terms of north sea paleo landscapes projects and things would have been possible without the support of uh, industry organizations like PGS. We are hopeful um, with the cooperation of the uh, gracious cooperation of people like Royal Haskening and that that we can work with the wind farm developers. This could actually be a fantastic opportunity to finally um, take this research to the end stage of, of hopefully finding people within this landscape. Thank you very much for listening. Um, ben, I guess. Okay, thank you, James. And remarkably, at the end of that day, we're coming in slightly early, which is great. So thank you to all the speakers for keeping time in this afternoon session. Um, there's a few questions and comments here. Uh, Martin's made a comment about the um, uh, difference between peat and mineralogenic sediments. We might return to that one and just um, maybe pick up on a few questions. We have one from uh, Jerry Gillies. I hope that's pronounced right. Uh, you've dismissed movement from Dogland into Scotland. How would you explain the appearance of pit houses on the 4th, C 10,500 BP, before anything similar elsewhere in Britain? Um, well, I, I, so uh, I, th I think that the, the, the issue is that um, uh, now, now that it's reasonably well established that there is a Paleolithic in Scotland, um, the question was inevitably raised that uh, people may have come via Doggerland into that area. Um, that Doggerland didn't extend that far north simply means that people cannot have, that Scotland was not physically connected uh, by land, um, as may have previously been thought. I, I, I'm not opposed to the idea of people going through Doggerland or from Doggerland into Scotland uh, via submerged coastlines or, or via mainland UK or via boat even. It's just the idea that people walked across a portion of land that it seems wasn't there. Um, and that happened relatively early on. Like I say, this is a point of contention for um, Paleolithic stuff really. Um, so I, one thing I would say from a more personal take on it is is don't underestimate the ability of people to network um, so I, I have no problems imagining that people were quite busily traveling backwards and forwards whether it was water or land in their way okay thank you um question here from 
the, the legend that is Martin Bell. How much potential is is there in identifying potential site location using models derived from terrestrial mesolithic site locations, which exist at least for Denmark and the Netherlands, so that's expl explicitly so in Britain? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think it has great utility um, at a, a near shore level. Um, I think. Uh, I think Peter Moastrup's done some great work recently looking for early Mesolithic sites and where they might be in Danish waters because a lot of the work that uh, Anders Fischer achieved was predominantly focused on later Mesolithic sites, I think. Um, people have talked about the application of this model elsewhere, Jonathan Benjamin and a few others as well. Um, I don't think it's really been implemented, but with regards to the offshore zone, I don't know. Um, I, really, it's probably too deep to be diver surveying uh, without using something like an ROV. So I think that would be a significant factor, if nothing else. Um, it's not unfeasible, but logistical problems, I think, is probably the, the main issue there. Yes. Hopefully that answers the question. 